I hope you get your running shoes on because we're going to get involved in a relay race this hour. Welcome to In the Market with Janet Parshall. Pull up a chair, make yourself comfortable. Uh, should the Lord tarry, and I don't know, but I, I got to just be real transparent with you. Could I just say, even so, come Lord Jesus, if we don't make it to supper tonight, I wouldn't be all that unhappy. In fact, I can't wait for uh, 2020 to be in the rearview mirror. How about you? But we're going to talk about the mandate, the necessity of knowing how to pass on Christianity, that that handing the baton off to the next generation and why that is so crucial. Because if we don't do that, have you ever thought about it? Is there a possibility that Christianity could literally become extinct? That's what we're going to talk about this hour. And we're going to talk to a man who has a very interesting career, as I see it. 1995, this gentleman, George Shamblin, decided that he would leave a very successful career in pharmaceutical sales because God called him into seminary. So off he went to Reform Theological Seminary. Since 2012, he served as a pastor with the Center for Executive Leadership. He's got an active role in leading overseas mission trips, and he serves as an adjunct professor at Birmingham Theological Seminary. But he joins us today with his book that speaks right to the topic that I just laid out before. It's called The Relay, Passing Along Your Faith in the Race to Save Christianity from Extinction. George, let me say thank you for the book. Let me say thank you even more for your time. That is a commodity I can never give back to you, and I don't ever want to be cavalier or ungrateful when someone gives me one hour of their time. So thank you, sir, for that gift. I so appreciate it. And I want to find out. I love to hear stories about how when God calls, people respond. Successful is an important word. Pharmaceutical sales is an interesting word. How in the world did you start thinking that that's where God wanted you to leave and to seminary is where he wanted you to go? What a great question. I'll just say this. I became a Christian When I was 20 years old, radical conversion, I mean, very radical, basically had to get to a point where I said, I surrender. And I mean, Mm. immediately Christ consumed my life. And I went to a minister and I kept saying, I've become born again. And my minister was actually getting red in the face. I kid you not. (laughs) And said, you've always been a Christian. You were raised in the church. And I said, no, you don't understand. Jesus is alive and I'm a new creation. Well, despite him being upset, he did have some good advice. I said, I really want to go to seminary. I want to be a pastor. And he was basically saying, hold on, just hold on. He said, if you are being called by God for ministry, he said, if you go work in the business world and you can't do anything else, that's a good indication God might be calling you to full-time mission. And so that's what I did. I was chomping at the bit, could not wait to get in ministry. So that's how I went from the professional world back into ministry. Wow. Wow. And you've never looked back, I'll bet, as you're running your race with perseverance. That's exactly right, which I I hear that Hebrews 12, 1 to 3 are some of your life verses. Is that correct? That's right. That is exactly right. That is exactly right. I love it for so many reasons. Maybe it's because my dad was a football coach and an athletic director. So I gravitate toward the athleticism of the believer's life. But I also love the fact that when there's so many distractions, the only way the runner is effective is by keeping their eyes on Jesus. And coming to you from the nation's capital, we got a boatload of distractions here. So I really love that verse. (laughs) So I, I, I gravitated immediately to your concept of the relay. And George, what you do so beautifully in the book is you point out several runners. For example, you start with Adam and you work all the way to Hebrews, which I'm thrilled about. And you talk about the way in which the faith was passed on. But let me go to the subtitle first, because it's a wake-up call. There are some, I would believe, who are listening, and we're talking to folks from Guam all the way to the Cayman Islands, who would say, no, 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 Christianity can never be extinct. There'll always be a remnant. So, you know, I'm not going to worry about it. In fact, I can just miss this hour of conversation completely. What would you say to them? (laughs) I would say, I do understand and believe there will always be a remnant until that last a uh, person is called to glory, and I certainly agree with that. That's undeniable. However, on the back cover, I explain, and this is the, the key, in any given area, Christianity is never more than one generation away from extinction. Mm-hmm. For mm-hmm. instance, in Judges, what happened? There arose a generation, this is after Joshua, who did not know the Lord or the things he had done in Israel. How many generations was that? One takes one generation to drop the baton, literally to drop the ball. We have to pass off the faith and and get the gospel out there. It's 
it's imperative. It's not kind of something we are suggested. If there's ever a time for us to be verbal and vocal and active, Janet, that time is right now. Amen. Could not agree with you more, George, which raises an interesting question. And thank you for lingering at 35,000 feet with me before we dig in deeper to some of the characters in your Bible and the book that you write about from the Bible. If you look at Barna, and I do I have every reason to believe that his stats are legitimate because he's a great researcher and he's fastidious about his methodology. But if the stats are true, and for argument's sake, I'm going to say they are, 90 plus percent of us, once we come to faith in Jesus Christ, don't tell somebody else about being that new creature in Christ that you reference in your own testimony. You know, I don't get that because it's sort of, it's like Peter and John, when they were told, sit down, be quiet, you're rocking the boat. They said, we cannot stop to, stop talking about that, which we've seen and heard. This should percolate out of us. This should be the natural extension of who we are. But George, in a post-truth world where uh, we're living in a sensate culture, sharing the gospel is neither popular nor is it comfortable. So you're hearing the music, and I want to give you the platform. When we come back, talk to me about that reticence. If we could if we could break down those, those hurdles, if I can put it that way, that are causing people to not run that race, I would like to do that so we get more runners. Let me continue with George Hamblin right after this. The book is called The Relay, Passing Along Your Faith in the Race to Save Christianity from Extinction. And only as a grad from Reformed Theological Seminary can do, he does this great flyover of his scripture from Adam all the way to the book of Hebrews about how the faith gets passed on generation after generation after generation. Back after this. He served Christians in Sudan through Voice of the Martyrs, and in December 2015, Peter Yasik became the one being persecuted. His story, Imprisoned by ISIS, is this month's truth duel. Enter into his prison cell, feel his loneliness, and witness his surrender. Ask for Imprisoned by ISIS when you give a gift of any amount to In the Market. Call 877-JANET-58, 877-JANET-58, or go to inthemarketwithjanetpartial.org. talking about running that race with perseverance, and I'm so glad we're going to spend the entire hour challenging us to be obedient to the transmission of the gospel of Jesus Christ, one generation away. That's all it takes. And you know, again, as I was just saying before the break, we have a preponderance of evidence, a great saying in the law that if we're not doing this and we see what's happening to young people who go to secular colleges and they fall away and now we've got all kinds of data that says 46 mm, percent of people who call themselves evangelical Christians think that, well, Jesus probably sinned, that the devil isn't real, that the Holy Spirit is a concept, not a person, not a part of the triune nature of God. And the list goes on and on and on. If you begin to dilute the cornerstone principles of Christian orthodoxy, what happens? You don't have it anymore. And by the way, just to be fully transparent, this program's called what? In the Market, right? It's the marketplace of ideas. The whole purpose of this program is to lovingly, gently nudge you in the ribs, get you out into the marketplace, because as Bunyan said in Pilgrim's Progress, you needs must pass through it. You're going to go out into the marketplace. Bunyan called it Vanity Fair. And when you get there, there's an opportunity for you to share the faith. So we're going to tell you how to do that by going back and studying those who have run before us. George Hamblin is with us. Since 2012, he served as a pastor with the Center for Executive Leadership. He's the author of the book, The Relay, Passing Along Your Faith in the Race to Save Christianity from Extinction. So, George, just before the break, I asked you, if we believe that Barna's data is true, and I think experientially we know that it is, why is there such a reticence for most of us to pass that baton to share our faith have we gotten to the point where personal comfort supersedes the idea that tonight, before we put our pillow on our head, there are people who will die and be eternally separated from God? You know, I can say down in the South, we've got so many people that are attending church. 
And yet, if you say who's legitimately sharing the gospel, giving a good word from God's word to other people, how many of you are doing that? And it's few and far between. So this is not a time to shame anybody, but it is a time to say, I'm telling you, I have never seen people more receptive to hearing the gospel, hearing a good word uh, than now. There's so much Mm. bad news. Uh, Can I tell a quick story that some guys and I are doing? Uh, I've got a Bible study with a bunch of businessmen, and I said, guys, we're going to start a not-so-secret fraternity to remain in good standing. (laughs) I'm going to give you a a bid. You get a sword of the Spirit to remind you to share the Word of God with other people. When you come next week, I say, don't come back unless you've gotten off the ropes, meaning you've jumped in the arena and shared the gospel. And every one of us, it's intimidating for guys, and it's awkward— are coming back every week saying, I got off the ropes and it, I was sharing these verses. I didn't think I could do that. But you just said it. People can't say, well, maybe tomorrow. It's mm-hmm. got to be today. Make yourself share a powerful verse with somebody else today. It has to be done. Yeah. Amen and amen. And I think, and, and I, I so appreciate your tender heart that this isn't about condemnation, because now, therefore, there isn't any for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. But this really is a wake-up call. It's saying to our brothers and sisters, we are on a precipice here, so we need to be obedient. And boy, I tell you, I just love the fact that society tells us in a myriad of ways that they want to know if God is real and how to know him personally. So I, I loved what you said about just having to do it somewhere along the way, and I don't know, it's just a hallmark of our times, George, but when I was a kid growing up in church, we got those hellfire and brimstone conversations all the time. It was crucial in my coming to faith in Christ, and it was a reality. But now this sort of flip where being accepted supersedes the painful, awful reality of eternal separation from God has caused us to be reticent in sharing our faith. So these men that you work with, they're businessmen. They got reputations. They have businesses they want to advance and protect. They're doing this at some level of risk. How did you help them get over that? Well, it it really does come down to accountability, and and that's a two-way street because every time when you come on Wednesday night or Monday morning, it's like, okay, did I share Christ with somebody? And I I had one of the guys call me up, and he said, George, you said you were going down south, which is kind of funny from being in Birmingham, but further (laughs) south on a a dove shoot, and he said— Uh, Did you get off the ropes? Did you share Christ? And I thought, okay, I've got to make the opportunity. And Janet, the Bible doesn't just say always sit back and wait for the opportunity. What Mm. does Ephesians say? The days Mm -hmm. are evil, therefore make the opportunity. So I think people have to make the opportunity to share the gospel. It's accountability. It's just something we've got to hold each other, our feet to the fire. I love that. I think that's your first very important takeaway, friends. Here's another one. I love the fact that very, very early on in the book, and I'd love for you to kind of recap what happened at Mexico City and the story that you tell there. But you point out that you kind of pull back, and rightfully so, and I concur, that we can't say that Christianity isn't a sprint, it's a marathon, because those are highly individualized sports. But that's not the way it is with the relay. Talk to me about this. Well, earlier you mentioned in the book of Acts that Peter and John were saying, we can't stop talking about what we've seen and heard. They're talking to other people. They're forwarding the faith. Uh, It's just somehow in Christianity, we felt like, no, this is individual. I I say somewhere in the book that rugged American individualism, that may be patriotic, which is great, but biblically, I can't just do this on my own. I have to think when I'm gone and passed away, has the Lord used me to bring other people to himself on a regular basis? I hope the answer is yes, and I'm doing everything to make sure it is. Wow. Wow. I just love the book. It's called The Relay, Passing Along Your Faith in the Race to Save Christianity from Extinction. Aren't you glad you kind of figuratively pulled over on the side of the road and you're listening to this? And I hope it stirs in your bones. Jeremiah called the Word of God fire in his bones. I hope by the time this hour is over, you've got your tennis shoes tied and you're ready to run that relay race back after this.
This is In the Market with Janet Parshall, and we are talking about that relay that is to be run, passing the baton from generation to generation, because if we don't, well, there'll always be a remnant, but Christianity does stand on the brink of extinction if we do not, in obedience, pass that baton on. George Shamblin is with us. He is part of a great organization called the Center for Executive Leadership. They're located down in Birmingham, Alabama. He teaches Bible studies. He disciples others at different places in their spiritual life. And he also is actively involved in leading mission trips. But he joins us today as the author of The Relay, Passing Along Your Faith in the Race to Save Christianity from Extinction. So my very first big takeaway is accountability. Our accountability, George, as you just taught us, <clears throat> becomes a catalyst. Without it, there's a marked resident, a re- reticence, particularly in a post-truth world, Oxford's word from 2016, to go out and share because, I, I hate to say it, but I think for many of us sheep, we'd rather be accepted and we'd like to be included rather than ostracized and pushed aside because we've been publicly identified with Jesus Christ. So accountability nudges us back into the race over and over and over again. The other thing you say in this excellent uh, analysis of using the relay, the handoff of the baton, a multi-person race, is that the baton is literally the word of God. Ah, George, here's our next conundrum. So we are more biblically illiterate now than we've ever been before. And maybe there are some listening who are saying, I can't pass it on. I don't know it that good. And so they step out of the race themselves. What would you say? I actually talk about that exact issue where people say, you know, that I'm not eloquent enough or I'm not educated enough. Actually, with Moses, he's standing before the Lord and said those exact same things, (laughs) that I'm not educated, I'm not eloquent, send somebody else. We say the same thing. But boy, once he had the Word of God and starts giving it to other people and realize the power therein, he could not stop talking about the power contained in the Word of God. We've just got to do the same thing, realize that power is there, but we can't hoard it. We've got to pass it to others. And, you know, I, I, for those I've talked to that have been involved in really races, that passing the baton is one of the most sophisticated and difficult aspects of that particular sport to master. Not looking back when you hand the baton, handing it literally almost blindsided to the person that's coming behind you. The meter of your gait when you're running to be able to do it in such a way that you don't slow down to the point where you can't continue and beat your opponent. I mean, there's all these logistics to it. So are you saying that even if I have some reticence about my knowledge of the word, my fear that somebody's going to ask me a question that I might know, that I might drop the baton in the race, I should still be a runner? No doubt about it. I, I tell you, I've got a guy one time, his name was Dennis, and I had friends 20 years ago say, George, you got to share the gospel with them. And I finally did. We're driving down the road. I fumbled every which way. It was <laughs> awful. I'm misquoting and contradicting, and I was so upset that afternoon. Well, the next day, Dennis came into my house. He was beaming like the sun, and he said, George, he said, I've never realized it before, but Jesus carried that cross just for me. Mm. Thank you for sharing yesterday, but here's the kicker. I didn't say anything the day before about Jesus carrying that cross just for him. Somehow, in my jumbled gospel presentation that was awful, God used a crooked stick to draw a straight line, and that individual ended up coming to know Christ. Wow. Wow. So can I linger here? Because I think this is so important. You know, you talk about sports and the athleticism of the believer's life. I I think too often we wrongly categorize our own personal win-loss record. Oh, I shared the gospel, but they didn't come to faith, so I don't get the notch there. And, oh, they did, so I guess I did it. Do we need to stop and remember, wait a minute, we're just the messenger, the cracked clay pot who carries this imperishable message and the completion of the work, the filling in the gaps, our bumbling is made perfect because of the work of the Holy Spirit. Doesn't that take a lot off our back? It really does. The Apostle Paul said as much that, through our weakness, God's strength is perfected. And it's not on the man who runs or the man who wills, but God who has mercy. We are just called to be faithful. That's really what he calls us. Be faithful. And he uses us in the process, uh, sometimes in a way we want to be used, other times maybe not. 
but it's all about being obedient. It, it really comes all back to being obedient to the gospel to go and to make disciples. Yeah, yeah. Can I just point out for one minute, because you do start with Adam and you go through several of the great heroes of the faith and ending up at Hebrews. I think very often, I'm just going to confess my problem here, is that I can look at the Bible and say, it's there and I'm here, when in fact, I'm part of it. And what I mean by that is, I'm connected to Adam, connected to Moses, connected to Joshua, connected to David, connected to Josiah, connected to Jesus, to John, to Peter, to Paul. If the, if I view this in your beautiful word picture of it being the handoff of a baton in a relay, I'm in the same race they were, am I not? And we've got the same baton, which is the very word of God. Thank you for saying that. We've got the baton. We've got the word. And it's the same word they passed off that we are commanded to pass off as well. Mm, wow. Well, I love the book. Obviously, it goes right to the core of why this very program exists. And I want to give you a chance to ask questions, too. Are you stumbling in an area where you just don't know how to effectively pass off that baton? Have you failed to get your tennis shoes on and get on the track to run that relay? Are you finding excuse after excuse instead of being obedient time after time? 877-548-3675. If you want to be a part of this conversation, pull up a chair. You know you're more than welcome. 877-548-3675. Back after this. Anyone can read the news. Every day on In the Market, we're committed to telling the news as seen through the lens of Scripture. As Christians, we must be informed about what's going on in the world and respond appropriately. When you become a partial partner, you ensure that we continue here on your station, equipping the church to discuss current events using the Bible as our solid foundation. Why not become a partial partner today? Call 877-JANET-58 or go online to InTheMarketWithJanetPartial.org. Let that song go and go. If you are just joining us, welcome. Boy, we've had a great conversation this far, and I can tell you how you can hear all of it. Go to in the market with JanetPartial.org, left hand side, two words, past programs. Click it on, download today's broadcast in its entirety or any of the programs we do, two hours every day, going back a full year. It's all in our audio library. Help yourself download the podcast so that you can listen. If you're just joining us, what a wonderful conversation we're having with George Shamblin. George, in 1995, left a very successful career in pharmaceutical sales, but he was on fire for the Lord. And he said, yes, Lord, when he was called and he went to Reform Theological Seminary. Since 2012, he has served as pastor with the Center for Executive Leadership. He's got an active role there in helping people grow in their walk with Christ. He's very involved in overseas mission trips. He's also an adjunct professor at Birmingham Theological Seminary, but he joins us today as the author of The Relay, Passing Along Your Faith in the Race to Save Christianity from Extinction. Wonderful word picture of taking that baton, which is the Word of God, a multi-person athletic event, not an individual sport by any stretch of the imagination, passing it on generation to generation to generation. Christine, you are in Idaho. You called 877-548-3675. I'm so glad you did. And your question for George, please. Hi. Um, yeah, I just wanted to know, I know in Romans, um, there is a warning. It talks about um, that if we suppress the truth, um, and it's a warning about suppressing the truth. So if Christians really believe what they believe and believe that the gospel is what saved them from hell. And we're not sharing that with other people. Do we really believe that? And I know at the beginning of the program, you guys talked about, you know, being light on people um, that don't share, but are we doing them any favor by being, you know, light on them for their own, you know, salvation as well? Mm. So that's my question. George. Yeah. I would say, you know, we just have to deal with everybody in a different way, in a different manner. I've got another group that I've really kind of challenged to to get in the arena 
and it's just been so much fun. We've had a tremendous uh, amount of joy to be doing that. But then there are other times where I may have a friend where I can talk much more directly and say, hey, brother, we, we believe this. And, you know, you're commanded. You can't suppress this. Christine, I'll I'll tell you my greatest, um, the saddest word picture in the world for me is for you or me or other believers to be standing somewhere and all of a sudden the rocks start preaching the gospel. Yes. You know, Jesus said, if we are silent, then even the rocks will proclaim we cannot yep. be silent. So mm. whatever it takes to challenge and encourage other people, now is the time. So thank thank you for that question. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Thank you for that answer, George. Becky, let me welcome you from Alabama. I'm glad you're here. Your question for George, please. Hi, Janet. Thank you for having me. Love your program. George, I have a question. So I have a a relative that uh, I have a close relationship to. Um, He was raised a Christian, um, but uh, when he was 19, his mother and his sister were tragically killed in a car accident, and um, we have invited him into our family uh, kind of almost like adopted him, uh, and he knows our stand. Uh, we, he knows that we love him unconditionally, but he has um, uh, he honestly confesses to us that he he has rejected Christ and and God, and and um, just is has totally embraced every other belief system there is out there, and uh, and uh, we just. We, we want to know how to love him more. And uh, do you have suggestions on how to reach, you know, family members that are, are skeptics? I, I sure do. I would say it has to be verbal and nonverbal. I think a lot of times with a situation like that, that we say, I love this person, but they don't want to listen. So maybe they'll just watch me and the way that I live and, and come to Christ. I, we can't depend on that. So I think it has to be verbal and we have to, yes, live, you know, and walk in a manner worthy of the gospel, like Paul said. But by the same token, we have to verbalize it and tell somebody, because I love you, you know, I found a, a cure in my life for emptiness and, and sin and, and lack of purpose and meaning. And it was the gospel. How wrong would it be for me not to share that with you? That, that's just my two cents in that situation, but it has to be verbal and nonverbal for certain. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Becky, thank you so. Really appreciate your being a part of the conversation. You're all welcome to join in with your questions at 877-548-3675. This is a mandate. This is a must, and yet we're just not showing up for the job. And as George rightfully says in the subtitle of his book, Christianity is on the brink of extinction. And if you don't believe me, just this is what George writes about in the book. What happens? How perilously close sometimes when that baton doesn't get passed from generation to generation. To help my friends understand the way in which you write this in the book, George, was there ever a point where as you read the scriptures, you go, wow, this could have so interrupted the ebb and flow of the generational passing on of the message of God and his word? Uh, Oh, for certain, you know, it's just so many times in Scripture, for instance, with Josiah, the Jewish people got so far away from the faith that a priest, a high priest, a king, and a scribe didn't even know what the Torah or the Bible was. Hmm. And you think, just imagine all the trouble that came before had they not lost their first love, the Scriptures, the Word of God, the God of their fathers. So that's a perfect example of people that forgot about their God and think all that they missed out on. But Josiah didn't say everybody sinned before and that's that. He said, no, we have to stand to God's word. We have to read it publicly. We have to serve Yahweh. And he turned things around himself. Yeah. Wow. Isn't it, Ezra, when the scrolls were open and the word was read again, the people were actually crying? They were so hungry for the word? Four hours. I think if we do the math, it was three hours of reading, Mm -hmm. three hours of confession. Sometimes people are just chomping at the bit to get out after an hour of worship. They were so (laughs) hungry for the word. It wasn't gospel fatigue. It wasn't gospel inoculation. It was we have to have more of the word. I hope we're the same way. I really do. 
Oh, amen. And the old saying from your mouth to God's ears, you use the word worship. You talk about this in the book. What's the linkage between worship and revival? We frequently say, oh, God, bring revival. What's the linkage between those two? Well, uh, of course, with worship, I'm called to worship individually. Jesus said as much. And John, to a a woman at the well, he said, you worship right here, right now, in spirit and in truth. Mm -hmm. But there's really something amazing that takes place when we introduce others into worship or two or three, that there's even something more special, I think, in the same way with the relay. If I'm running as an individual, that's great, but something even more special and amazing happens when I bring others along that run to my right, to my left, all for the glory of God. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely right. Wow. Well, let me go back to the race, because you talk about this in the book. I was mentioning before, when you take that piece of equipment, it's called the baton, and you pass it off, there's a whole technique to that. I have seen runners who will just do short little sprints when they're part of a relay team, just to kind of learn how to, with such a gentle touch, but accuracy, pass it off. You say there's something called a blind handoff. How does that work contextually when we're talking about passing on the faith? Well, Peter is a perfect example. Sometimes it was almost like, forget the baton, he just ran. (laughs) And there was a time for him to wait, as Jesus told him. You got to wait for the Holy Spirit, which he did. But then in Acts chapter 2, when it was time to run and to preach the gospel, he preached the gospel. So there is a time to take off running. There's another time to be still And we've just got to allow the Word to navigate us through that process to know which time we are to do what. Yeah. George, just to pause for one moment, isn't it interesting, and maybe it's just because when you come to faith in Christ, when you're knee-high to a grasshopper as a kid like I was, you hear this stuff over and over and over again. And sometimes the familiarity, the rote declaration of these profound truths become so familiar, they fail to lose their their importance and their urgency in your life. But you've said over and over again, the application is two things. One is the word, the word, the word, the word. Don't even put your track shoes on if you're not in the word, because what is it we're passing on, right? Number two, recognizing the work that the Holy Spirit plays in all of this. That takes, that's a catalyst for involvement, but it also, as we said earlier, helps us to really take away the feeling that I've blown it when, in fact, as you gave your beautiful example, the Holy Spirit Mm -hmm. can fill in the blanks and does that on a regular basis. So that's important for us. So there's an implied here that I don't want to miss over because it's rudimentary, but it's fundamental. we got to get in the Word more, do we not? And how would you, as someone who is part of the Center for Executive Leadership, how do you encourage people to get in the Word and stay in the Word? Well, Well, I certainly think Jesus, we know, said that if we love him, we'll keep his commandments. And we're called to meditate on his word, love his word, to spend time in the word is to spend time with Jesus. We've got to do both. Love it. The book is called The Relay. and love the subtitle, Passing Along Your Faith in the Race to Save Christianity from Extinction. George Hamblin is our guest. More right after this. songs stick with you the rest of your life. That is one in my life. Thank you, Twyla, for that. George Hamblin is with us. His book is called The Relay, Passing Along Your Faith in the Race to Save Christianity from Extinction. 877-548-3675. John in Wisconsin, the warmest of welcomes. Your thoughts, please. 
Well, thanks for the welcome, Janet. Hello, George. Hope you guys are well. Mm-hmm. And I just Thank had you. a comment to make towards the, oh, you're welcome, to the analogy of passing the baton. I remember in track, as part of it, the person that had the baton that was coming up upon the next person would actually yell, go. And mm. that kind of threw into the analogy that uh, we got to say something. So uh, I thought of that and just thought I'd pass it on. I was hoping I'd hear from somebody who did track and field, John. I think that's excellent. And I love, George, the idea that there really is that verbal catalyst to keep going, to take it from the next person and to pass it on to the next person with a go. That really speaks to your picture, the word picture of the relay of passing on the faith, doesn't it? It it does. And Jesus in the high priestly prayer in John 17 says, Lord, the word that you've placed in my hand. It literally reads, the words you've placed in my hand, I've placed in their hand. And so that's that just passing of the word uh, from from one to the other. I think the word is changeover, and that really is the, the premise of this book, changeover. We have to replenish ourselves and other people who serve Christ and are consumed by him and his word. Yeah, I love that. Can I, you end with Hebrews, and boy, I would love for you to talk about that. You talk about the author knowing what it meant to hit the wall and yet still endure. Talk to us about that. Yeah, I, I really would say my ministry has been more from a position of weakness than strength. At mm-hmm. some point, I could go into more detail about that. And if I had a choice to you know, be used of the Lord for more of the strength, then, you know, I probably would have chosen that, but I've hit my own set of walls and some different things and, um, you know, even struggle with some depression in the past and anxiety. And yet the Lord has opened up a whole new avenue of other people who limp, other people who've, you know, had some stumbles and some struggles. And it's just a great chance for me to say, yes, you're hitting the wall or you're on some tough times, but his grace is sufficient. Mm-hmm. Please continue to press on. Yes. Can I linger here? Because I think out of that whole passage in Hebrews, I love the, and, and, and the word changes bit to bit, depending on what translation you're reading. But some say run with perseverance. Some say run with endurance. Some say run with zeal. But there's a sense of continuation of you can't quit. You can't throw in the towel. You, George, just gave an answer to that. When you're battle fatigued, and there is a battle going on all around us, how do we stay in the race when the temptation is to say, I have hit a wall, I want to give up? I I think the best thing we can do is to share with another runner, be real, and say, I'm having a tough time. Christians, we are so good at talking about a rough season in the past or something we've struggled with, but there's a nice, neat little bow tied to the end of that story. And Mm -hmm. today everything's just great. Well, sometimes I need other people to tell me that they're having a a tough go and then I can lean on them and they can lean on me. We, We just have to find those one or two other people that we can say, this is really what's going on. And I just need a friend to encourage me in Christ They can't do it if we remain silent. Yeah, amen. George, because you're very often involved in mission trips, and I know that you wouldn't be doing this, A, if you weren't listening to the Lord's calling on your life to do something like that, but as you share the gospel someplace other than in the United States, is there a receptivity there? Is there a obedience to the mandate to be a part of the relay more readily acceptable and understood and inculcated in the believers' lives other countries outside of the United States? In other words, do we have particular challenges here in the States that make us ineffectual runners? Oh, that is a great question. We do we do ministry down in Cuba. And when you say receptivity, oh, I'm getting chill bumps, my stars, thinking about this. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> there are times whew, we go down there, and it just reminds me of the Macedonian vision Mm. where Paul saw somebody waving their hand, saying, come and share the gospel. And there are times we go to Cuba where people are so hungry for Christ and the scriptures, and they realize that all these other things aren't working. They literally will wave us into their home. We don't have Mm. giveaways. We don't have trinkets. We have Bibles, and yet they are starving 
to hear the word of God. Oh, I pray that would happen in this country. I pray it would happen here. Absolutely. So do you think that the possibility exists that there would be a third great awakening here in the United States? I I want that vision in America, that Macedonian vision as well here. Do you think it can happen again? I think it can, but there's, there's a catch. It's not going to happen magically with Christians sitting in pews and, and just, you know, going to church and that's it. We go to church to get energized and to get us back out there Sunday afternoon for the rest of the week to continually get it out there. I do. I promise. I think people are realizing that all these other institutions they trust in, that there's no rock. That it, it's swaying. Well, Christ is that anchor. I think people are more receptive now than any time in my lifetime. This is a, a great opportunity, a window for the gospel like I've never seen before. George, I absolutely agree. It's just a question of whether or not the runners will show up, tie up their shoes, and get on the track. I love the book, and I, and I barely got into the stories. Remember, he talks about all of these great Bible characters, Adam and Moses and Josiah and Peter and John and Jesus. I left that to you. You read the book. You see how this idea of passing the baton is exemplified through all of these people we read about in Scripture. Read the book. You've been called. The gun went off some time ago. The race is in the process of being run. Get on the track. We'll see you next time, friends.